food revival, we called it. It was a food revival. Uh, people were hungry. They needed food. And he revived the, the, the five loaves and multiplied, multiplied them. And it started off from an insignificant lunch bag that a little boy had in his hand, which if it wasn't for the loving care and preparation and attention to detail of his mom that prepared that lunch at home, that revival would not have occurred. And we said how God is teaching us through that, that we are revivals in our communities, in our families, in our cities, has to start at home in each and every one of us. How many say amen? We said that we, we always expect revivals to come from outside and come down, but that's not where true revival begins. True revival begins from the inside of every believer, from the inside and the depths of your heart and your soul, through the impact of the Holy Spirit in your life, and it should then spread into your home and be a true home revival that then spreads out and feeds into the community. We discussed that to ensure that we can properly usher a home revival, we need to make sure we have the proper elements in our lunch bag. We have to have five loaves and two fish, just like the little boy. And remember those five loaves we spoke about? We said one of them is the, the loaf of the bread of faith. We also have to have the loaf of the bread of the word. We also have to have the loaf of the bread of the presence of Jesus Christ. We also have to have the loaf of the bread of fervent prayer and the loaf of bread of true Christian parenthood in every household. Also, the two fish that we need. We need the fish of the calling and the fish of the creed, which is, means that we must have a clear and defined creed of and belief in Jesus Christ. And for that to happen, Jesus has to be your personal, intimate Lord and Savior, and you must have a living relationship with the living God in your own heart and also foster that relationship in your home and your family. How many say amen? But today, God has a different word for us. God has a question for us. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer back to those that are old enough or old as me, or possible old wrestling fans. You might remember this little catch line. God has a question for us today. What you going to do? <laughs> for those of us that used to watch wrestling back in the day, uh, our, 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 our famous wrestler Hulk Hogan's catch line was, what you going to do? But it's not about Hulkamania today. God is asking you what you're going to do to be able to live a life of peace, of joy, of renewal, of victory, of blessing, of covering, of favor, of provision, of restoration, of freedom, of anointing, of empowerment during this increasingly turbulent, chaotic, tumultuous, volatile, 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 unstable, and apocalyptic time that we're living in. What are you going to do? And I want you to ask me people around you, or the one next to you, what are you going to do? Tell them, ask them, ask them, what are you going to do? If you're at home, ask your neighbor or your cat or your dog, what are you going to do? You got nobody around you, ask yourself, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to be able to overcome everything that's happening today? What are you going to do to be able to get through the day, to get through the week, to be able to, 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 to even survive? Uh, and get through your depression, get through your anxiety. What are you going to do? Hmm. To live a victorious and a glorious life now, not later, not in the eternal by and by, not after I pass away. I want to live my eternal life now. What are you going to do, church? I feel the Holy Spirit. Because I need you to understand something. I need you to understand this. Uh, that there are specific things that we have to do. Uh, oh, hallelujah. We still have to be converted. Somebody. Mm, wait a minute, Pastor. Hold it. I already did that. I did that 20 years ago when I gave my life to him. Hmm. Let's in, look at this a little bit more closely. Because if we look at the context of this verse, we understand that this is the apostle Peter. Peter. 
giving this proclamation right after he performed the miracle with his brother from another mother, John, the other apostle, that they were in front of the temple and they just performed this miracle through the power of the Holy Spirit and God of being able to cure the paralyzed man that was begging in the front of the temple. If you read earlier in chapter 3 of Acts, you'll see that miracle. And right after that miracle, the people saw what happened. They were amazed. They were shocked. They were gathering around. And Peter started declaring and telling them that you need to repent and be converted. But do you understand that that message is not just for those that don't believe? That message also applies that are already part of the body of Christ. So to, uh, to understand how this is the case, I need you to understand what those two words, repent and converted, actually mean. So let's break this down. Can we break this down together? So take notes, guys. What does repent mean? I want to look at the secular definition of that word, repent. If you're watching at home, you're probably already Googling it. That's okay. Notice, I, it's so funny. We were talking about technology and how we're having so many issues with it. And, 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 and we made technology part of our everyday vernacular. I mean, 10 years ago, if I would have said, you need to Google it, people would say, what is that? Is that a disease? Or what, what is a Google? And today we just use it like, I just realized, I'm sorry. I just aged myself. I'm an old timer. I'm sorry. I'm just shocked that I just said that in a sermon. You need to Google it. Praise the Lord. All right. But if you have, you'll see that one of the definitions uh, I went off on a tangent. One of the definitions, the secular definitions of repentance or repent is a sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. Okay, that's, that's one definition. Another one, to feel sorrow, regret, or contrition for something. Okay? Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which is the gold standard of dictionaries, defines repent as the following. To turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. That's the Webster Dictionary. But now I want to talk about the biblical and spiritual definition of repent. The closest secular definition is the Webster Dictionary because look at what the biblical definition of repent is. is to make a change of mind, heart, and action by turning away from sin and self and returning to God. How many praise God for that? Repent, again, is to make a change of your mind, of your heart, and your actions, turning away from sin and from yourself, your own desires, and returning to God. The bottom line is repent is a literal 180-degree turn away from sin and turning towards God. That's what repent means. Hmm. 180 degrees. What does that mean? Literally in the opposite direction of sin, away from sin, away from condemnation, and moving towards holiness and eternal life and a relationship with God. That's what repent means. So, so he says, repent, turn away from sin, turn away from yourself, turn towards God, and then he says, be converted. So the first thing we got to do is repent. The second is be converted. What is the definition of convert? Hmm. Convert means the following, secular, to cause, to change in form, character, or function. Another definition, to change one's religious faith or other belief. Merriam-Webster defines it, to bring over from one belief, view, or party to another, or to alter, this one I love, to alter the physical or chemical nature or properties of something, hmm. converting, so changing its, physiolo its physiology, excuse me, okay, changing its physical property and nature. And it also says to change from one form or function to another. 
So the biblical definition of convert is similar to Webster's, but it goes more to a spiritual level where it says that the biblical definition of conversion or converting or convert is a total transformation of change of the core destination of a person's life. It is a spiritual metamorphosis that is manifested in our external daily lives our daily decisions, our attitudes, our actions, and our lifestyle. How many understand and can say amen if you understand what convert means? So what I said was the two things we have to do to live a victorious, glorious, eternal life now with Jesus Christ and God in the midst of this turmoil and chaos is to be what? To repent and to be converted. Now you say, well, pastor, I told you I did that 20 years ago when I accepted Jesus. But what I'm trying to tell you, what the Bible is trying to tell us, what God is trying to tell you, that repentance and conversion is not a one and done event. How many say amen? Repentance and conversion should be a daily, continual, ongoing process in the daily life of every believer, of every Christian, and of every person that has an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. It is intentional. Did you know that? Oh, but pastor, I repent whenever I sin. It shouldn't be just when you sin. Every day you should repent. What does repent mean? You should determine in yourself, today I will turn away from sin, from anything that draws me away from God. I will turn away and cast aside my own desire. I will submit my, oh, I'm talking to somebody in the house of the Lord. You need to get this in your spirit. Today you have to determine in yourself that in order to get through the day, you have to say, God, I bury myself. I humble myself. I turn turn my own desire away and I turn to you. Oh, that's why the psalmist says, I will raise my eyes onto the hills and where will my help come from? Where will my strength come from? Where will my joy come from? Where will my peace come from? Where will my healing come from? My restoration and renovation only comes from you, Lord. Can somebody praise him in the house of God? We must be intentional and live daily a life of continual repentance. We as Christians must continually choose, intentionally choose to live in holiness. We preached about this, a sermon series, true holiness. We said this, true holiness is intentional. It's a conscious effort and a determination and commitment to live apart from sin. How many say amen? We said holiness doesn't come from what you do. Listen. (laughs) Oh, the more I do, the more holy I get. No. You are holy in virtue of the act of faith, of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are holy by his work, by his blood, and by the Holy Spirit of God. But to live in holiness, it says it is something we must do. The Bible says, be holy because I am holy. This is God speaking to the church. So we have to determine in ourselves, I want to live in holiness. I'm going to live in repentance, in continual turning away from the sin from my past life, from my old self, and turning and walking in God's word to him, in him, and working through him for the good of those around me and for the glory of the Lord. Can somebody say amen? Intentional repentance fosters humbleness. Listen to me. I'm going to have to preach this. The Holy Spirit is telling me something. You need to understand those that live in arrogance. Obviously, there's something that's wrong. Because if you live in arrogance, then there is no repentance. Mm. Arrogant believers don't live in repentance. 
because they think they're all that in a bag of chips. They think, oh, I can do no wrong. I'm holy. Oh, and they have this misconception of holiness, and we've spoken about this in the True Holiness series. Uh, it's not spiritual arrogance. It's not I'm spiritually better than. Nobody is better than nobody else. I'm going to tell you something. Even though you're saved, you're no better than nobody that's out in the street that isn't saved. Oh, but I got Jesus. That doesn't make you better. That makes you saved, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and it's should humble you, not make you arrogant and boastful, but say, God, it's by your mercy and your grace because I didn't deserve this. I was just as bad as the addict that's on the street, but you saved me. You washed me. You redeemed me. You healed me. You lifted me up and you made me new. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? I feel a Pentecostal oh, spirit in the house of God. I rebuke the spirit of arrogance. Because if you have arrogance, you will never be repentful. And if you're never repentful, you will never be humble. And if you don't have repentance, you cannot walk into God's true forgiveness, somebody. There are a bunch of believers in the church that aren't truly saved yet. Oh, somebody. Ooh, preach it, pal. Oh, I'm telling myself to preach this. You may get uncomfortable. You may feel itchy. You may feel like you got some ants in your pants in this moment, but it ain't the ants. It's the Holy Spirit convicting you right now. Don't worry about it. You got masks on, so I can't tell. That's okay, but God knows. Huh. If you're living in arrogance, if you don't have repentance, then you haven't truly been saved yet, somebody. Because if you cannot live in repentance and in humbleness, recognizing that you're no better than nobody else, uh, that you're just as, 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 as susceptible to sin as anybody else, and it is by the power and grace of God and his Holy Spirit in my life that it keeps me, that it covers me, that it favors me, that it blesses me, not because of who I am, but because of Jesus in my life. That's why we have what we have, because it's the grace of God that keeps us and blesses us and makes us whole. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? Notice the central scripture. The apostle Peter said, repent and be converted. He did not say repent and convert. Mm. Interesting. The words that he used. He could have said repent and convert. But he said convent, excuse me, he said repent and be converted. And the focus is on the be. Be, be converted. Because it's up to us to decide to convert. We think we got to have the Holy Spirit is going to fall down. The dove is going to fly down and land on my shoulder. And all of a sudden, abracadabra, mm, I'm converted. That's not how it works. You have to intentionally decide, I will be converted today. And through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, declare the power of sanctification. Did you understand that when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's an ongoing, progressive work of God called sanctification that is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit continually will renew your mind, renew your soul, renew your body, renew your spirit, and bring you closer and closer to God and further and further away from your old self look at what Ephesians 4 22 through 24 says I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation this is the Apostle Paul speaking we have to be intentional about throwing off our old man and putting on the garments of salvation and our new creation and our new man look at what he says verse 22 says the following throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Verse 23, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Paul is saying you have to be converted. You have to consciously say, I'm taking all my old self, throwing it away. I'm crucifying it with Christ, and I'm going to put on my new self, my new garments of salvation, and I will choose to crucify the old and live in the new. How many say amen? In fact, we must choose to crucify our old man. 
Christ is not going to just grab it and throw it up and nail it on the cross. We have to surrender our old self voluntarily, crucify it, put our past nature on the cross along with Jesus so our old sinful self may die along with Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. Look what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. Again, New Living Translation. My old self, this is Paul speaking, has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting. Another translation says by depending in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen to me, church. There are people that even though they are believers, just like me, are battling with depression, with heaviness, with heavy hearts, with heavy thoughts, with heavy negative feelings. But you know what? Every day, that's why we have to be repentful and every day crucifying those things and throwing it on the cross. Oh, but pastor, that's easier said than done. I know it. It's not easy. If it was easy, anybody could do it. But that's why Paul says that I do it not within myself. I do it by trusting in Jesus. Somebody praise him in the house. It's trusting in his power, his grace, his love, his spirit that will give Give you the strength to nail your depression to the cross, to nail your anxiety to the cross. And there will be days where you barely can do it, but God says, trust in me because I have never left you and I never will forsake you. And as long as you have faith in me, I will give you strength. Can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord? God's love, his forgiveness is always freely given. How many know that? His love and forgiveness is free, right? Right, Melanie? We know that. But we must intentionally repent in order to be able to enter into his forgiveness. It's given. We said this. Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And he died for sins, not only that you have committed or that you're committing, but that you haven't even committed yet. So the forgiveness is there. It's paid for. It's it's out there. How do I walk into the forgiveness? How do I access and connect myself to that forgiveness? Repentance, somebody. Somebody say repent. Say that with me. Repent. You must repent every day. Every day I wake up and I repent. Father, help me. Father, forgive me. Father, help me turn to you and away from me. Help me, Lord, that you grow and I be able to diminish. Help me that your power, oh, oh, and anointing abide in me and my strength relies on you. Uh, tell God to re- tell God how repentful you are. Tell him how much you want to turn away from your past and turn towards and into him uh, in order to enter into the forgiveness and obtain true reconciliation with God. We have to be repentful by accepting the sacrifice the blood and the resurrection and the lordship of Jesus Christ in our hearts and over our lives every single day how many say amen when was the last time and don't answer this out loud I need everybody to meditate on this when was the last time that you put yourself before the cross of Calvary hmm let that marinate for a second If you're listening at home, when was the last time that you threw yourself at the foot of the cross of Calvary? I'm going to tell you something. I have to do it every single day. Because I know who I am. I know how weak I can be. I know where I'm weak, but the Bible says, I'm I'm telling this to somebody. This ain't even in my notes. This is a Rema word for somebody that's listening online or that's here in church. You need to hear this loud, hear this clear, because the Bible says, let the weak say we are strong. Not because of who we are, but because of who God is in us. Can somebody praise him? Can somebody say, I am strong, Jesus? Not because of me, but because of you and your spirit in my life. Praise him if you want to praise him in the house of the Lord it's through his strength and the weaker you are the stronger his power gets in your life when you lean on him somebody praise him Hmm. 
How do I lean on God? Be repentful. The more you repent, the more you depend less on you and more on him. The more you humble yourself in that repentance, the more God's power is manifested in you and through you and in everything you do. Oh, that brings me to my second point. What you're going to do, repent and be converted. And there's an outcome, point two. What is the outcome of that? Look at what Acts 3, the central scripture tells us. Acts 3.19, second part of the verse, part B says that your sins may be blotted out. Mm. What does that mean? Blotted. Blotted. Some people say erased. Some versions say taken away. Our sin debt has been paid and our sins are no longer counted against us when we are reconciled with God the Father through Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross of Calvary. How many say amen? Ooh, not many. How many say amen? Did you know that? If you accepted Jesus as your savior, then your sin debt is paid. It's like walking into a bank when you owe millions of dollars, and all of a sudden you go to the bank and you say, look, I don't got money to pay it. And you know what the bank official says? Yeah, I know. That's why I sent you the past due notice. But all of a sudden, that bank official comes from behind the desk and then takes off his bank official jacket and now puts on a philanthropy jacket and writes you a check for the million dollars that you owe and says, your debt is paid. That's what Jesus did for you and me. We walked in before the Father, the Heavenly Father, and we said, look, I've I, I got sin in my life. These sins are, are not allowing me to access you, God. And the Holy Spirit and Jesus looks at you and says, Father, he deserves to die. He deserves to be condemned because he has sinned. And you know what Jesus says? I'm the judge and I condemn you. But then he gets off the judge's bench, takes off his robe, and then he shows you his blood and says, if you accept me, I will pay the price. I will die for you instead. I will give you eternal life. And when you accept him, your debt is wiped clean. How many praise the name of Jesus for that work of Jesus Christ? Look at what 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, New Living Translation. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world... To himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Jesus reconciles us through to the heavenly father. That's why he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can come to the father except be through me. <laughs> All things in Jesus are made new. Did you know that? 2 Corinthians, Paul again says, 517, New King James. Look at what he says here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, some things, the little things, the not so bad things. Is that what it says? What does he say? What? All things have become new. Every aspect of your life, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, financial, familial, every aspect, social, everything is made new through Jesus. And the beautiful thing, I've heard somebody say this, yeah, because when you come to Jesus, God forgets your sin. Have you heard that before? How many have heard that? God forgets your sin. When you accept Jesus, right? You've heard that. I see a couple of people nodding. I've heard that. But did you know that's incorrect? <laughs> God can never forget. It's against his nature. God doesn't forget. It's impossible for God to forget. He's not human. His mind can never forget. He is omniscient, all-knowing, all the time. There's nothing that gets by him. He never forgets anything. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Look at what the Bible teaches us in Hebrews. Chapter 8, verse 12, New Living Translation. 
And this is God speaking, I will forgive their wickedness. And look at what he says. I will never again remember their sins. And you're probably thinking, well, well, hold up, pastor. That's the same thing as forgetting. No, it isn't. Look at that carefully. He says, I will never again remember. He doesn't say, I will forget their sins. He doesn't say, it will, I, I will pretend it never happened. No, he says, I will never, it says, I will never again remember. He chooses to never recall and he chooses to never bring into his mind or to you your past sin. So if you're hearing voices criticizing yourself, if you're hearing voices in your head and your spirit talking about what you did and the sins that you committed and you're still the same and look at you and how could you, how could you come to church and raise your hands and praise him when you done did this and you done did that, that is not the Holy Spirit, that is not the voice of God that is the voice of Satan himself and you need to get up rebuke him and tell him that's right Satan yes I done did that but Jesus paid the price he forgave me he redeemed me he renewed me he restored me he has healed me he has made me new and I am no longer a slave to sin and fear because I am a child of God can somebody praise him in the house of the Lord But when God forgives us, he chooses to never remember. Not because he can't, because he says, I'm not going to remember it. The blood of Jesus has covered you, somebody. Can somebody praise him for that? That brings me to my third and final point. The resulting continual blessing because of that outcome. We talked about first point, two things that we must do. Second point. The outcome of that things that we do. And now the third point is the continual, the resulting continual blessing that we live in because of the outcome of Jesus Christ and our repentfulness and our being converted every day in him. Look at what Acts 3.19, third part of the verse, part C says, I'm going to read it out of New King James again, and it says, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. See, many people stop at the sins being blotted and say, "Woo, praise God, I'm free. That's right. He who the Son has freed is set free indeed. That's right. Oh, I'm no longer a slave to sin. That's right. But it doesn't end there, guys. We miss, out, we miss out on stuff because we're already so excited. Ooh, I'm going. I, I don't need to read the rest. Read the rest of the verse. There's an ongoing, continual blessing that we're missing out when we don't read the word completely. Look at what it says. He says, so that times of refreshing. <laughs> Another version says, renewal, restoration may come from where? The presence of the Lord. So when the Lord is your Savior and your Lord, when Jesus is on the throne of your heart and in your life, you abide every day in his presence. Yes? Amen? And from his presence in our lives, we have times of refreshing and renewal. When we seek and abide in the presence of the Lord and his presence abides in us, there is a spiritual refreshing and in renewal and empowerment through the Holy Spirit of God. When you feel down, when you feel out, when you feel heavy burdened, when your mind is overwhelmed, when anxiety is overtaking you, when you feel like you can't do it anymore, when you feel like you want to quit, when you feel like your armor is not holding up, when you feel like your shield is too heavy to carry, when you feel like you don't have the strength to pray. You can just go into his presence. Is anybody understanding what I'm talking about? Lock yourself in your room and just cry to Jesus. You don't got to say nothing. You don't got to verbalize nothing. It says that the Holy Spirit will start praying on your behalf and in those crying and indiscernible weeping moments, the Holy Spirit will pray for you, will lift you up to heaven, will connect you to God's power and you will feel his rest. Oh, is somebody feeling restored in Jesus today and he will give you new strength and new hope in him can somebody praise him in the church of Christ 
That's the blessing that comes from repentfulness and converting yourself every day and abiding in the presence of the Almighty. Oh, that's why I love the psalm that says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Lord will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Shadow is refreshing. When you're in a hot day, it's hot outside. You got no AC. You don't even got a glass of water, but you see this big oak tree and you sit under the shade. What happens when you feel that cool breeze in the shade? You are refreshed. That's what it is when you abide in the secret dwelling place of the Lord. Oh, the psalmist says there's a blessing that comes from abiding in the secret, in the dwelling, in the spirit, in that intimacy, in that secret room. And it does not have to be a physical room. When I say secret room, it could be right there in the middle of a crowd, but you go into this secret. I go to my happy place. Ooh, somebody. You know, my happy place is when I close my eyes and I just think about Jesus. Somebody. Oh, when I think about Jesus. Oh, I, I, tell my, I tell my wife, I'll, I'll say, Pastor Dolly, think about Jesus. Oh, I, because there are days that she gets up and she doesn't even have the strength to pray. There are days that I get up and I don't even have the strength to pray. But when I think about Jesus, uh, oh, somebody say Jesus. Uh, somebody say Jesus. Uh, when you declare his name, Jesus, uh, you don't got to say nothing else. Uh, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit takes over and you just say Jesus. If you're sick, Jesus can heal you. If you're depressed, Jesus can give you joy. If you're sad, Jesus can give you a song. If you oh, if you have no strength, Jesus can give you rest. Can somebody praise the name of Jesus in the house of the Lord? Not only do we have continual refreshing, we have ongoing forgiveness and advocacy. Ooh, that's a big word, Pastor. Advocacy. As Christians. If we should fall, we shouldn't live in sin. We're repenting. We're converting. But if we are in our human nature, stumble and fall into sin. Look at what the Bible says. John 1, 9. New Living Translation. We're almost done. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness now this verse was specifically written not for those that don't believe this was written for the church of christ how many knew that oh pastor yeah that's for people that don't believe no 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 john wrote this to the church he's talking to believers that if we fall in sin and we confess our sins to jesus to him to god he is faithful to forgive us he is just to forgive us and cleanse us again every day. Go before the cross and say, Jesus, cleanse me with your blood once again. Renew me with your spirit and your blood. Oh, wash away any wickedness and iniquity that may be in me because of my nature. And let me live in my new self that is through you. Hallelujah. As his church and the body of Christ, we should live and strive to live in holiness. But if we do fall into sin, not only do we have ongoing forgiveness, we have an ongoing advocate. Did you know that? You know what an advocate is. Another word is a lawyer. Ooh. Forget about Morgan and Morgan. Forget about anybody else. 1-800, whatever number there is. Just Jesus, that's it. 1-800, Jesus. He's your lawyer. He's the best lawyer you can have. He's never lost a case. Did you know that? Never lost. Perfect record. But he's our advocate. He's our lawyer. Look at what 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says. This is, again, John speaking to the believers and to the church. He says, my dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But, he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ. 
the one who is truly righteous. And verse 2 says, he himself is the sacrifice. Not only does he advocate, he says, Father, forgive them because I, he says, he is the sacrifice. I sacrificed myself. I gave my blood. Look at them through the blood that I shed on the cross that atones, it says, for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. That is the advocate that we have, the lawyer that we have, that fights for us and on our behalf. To conclude, church, I ask you the following. What you going to (laughs) do? Once again, what are you going to do? (laughs) Hallelujah. 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 What are you going to do? I'm going to ask the audio to unmute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are you going to do, church? Stand up on your feet with me. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to be able to get through the chaos of this life? To be able to live in holiness for God. What are you going to do to be able to live victoriously and walk out in your Christian faith and relationship with God? What are you going to do to be able to be forgiven of your sins and have them blotted out and to be able to have Jesus as your everyday advocate and lawyer on your behalf? What are you going to do to be able to be refreshed and renewed whenever we seek to come into the presence of the Lord or when we are troubled or weary or struggling or depressed or frustrated or confused or weak or sad or anxious or heavy burdened? Jesus says, come to me all that are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. This is what Jesus says. What you're going to do, what we must do, what we have to do is to intentionally and continually repent and be converted. Hallelujah. If you haven't been doing that, then today is the day that you make the shift. Today in your heart, I need you to determine through the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus that sits on the throne of your heart. Say, God, today I shift myself. I change my way. I am truly making a 180 degree turn from what I used to be. And I'm turning to you and towards you, God. I will continually be repentful and converted and allow your Holy Spirit to sanctify me and process me and make me more like you. If you're listening at home or you're here in the sanctuary and Jesus is not your Lord, then here's the thing that you first have to do. Jesus has to be and must be on the throne of your life and the throne of your heart. He has to be your Lord and Savior. You first must allow Jesus to reconcile you with the Heavenly Father. By accepting the sacrifice that he made on the cross and have him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus must be your Lord. He must be your Savior so that we can live daily, intentionally in repentance and conversion and live in true, victorious, glorious, and eternal life now. Friend, if you're listening to me. Eternal life doesn't begin after you die if you accept Jesus today. Well, if I accept him today, it doesn't make sense because I got to wait till I die to live eternal life. No, eternal life begins the second you give your heart to him. Heaven is a perfect extension of what we're living now. But for that to happen, Jesus has to be on the throne of your heart. If there's anyone today that got a word, can I see your hands? Can you just lift up your hands right where you are? If God spoke to you today, raise your hand. God bless you. 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 Almost everybody. God bless you. If you're at home, just type in the comments. If you be able to type in comments, I got my word. I will live in repentance and I will be converted every single day through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the work of Jesus Christ. And through him and in him, I will receive strength, renewal, refreshing, and empowerment, and live gloriously in my eternal life. Be intentional, be dedicated, be purposeful, and you will see the glory of the Lord in your life. If anybody has not accepted Jesus, then this is your day. If you have someone in your family that needs to accept him, then prophetically, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. And one day they will be saying this on, on, in their stead on their own. 
So if you're at home, we're going to have this up on the screen. I do this every single week. For those that want to accept Jesus, and just say this simple prayer. And if you say it with all your heart and all your faith, then I believe at the end of this prayer, you will be a new creation. You will be jointly crucified with Christ and resurrected as a new born again Christian, born again into the body of Christ. And you will be my brother and sister. So we'll say this as we always do. Heavenly Father, I come before you. And I know that I am a sinner. I truly repent. Oh, there's the word. And ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I accept the sacrifice of your only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross of Calvary, where he shed his blood for me to wash me of all my sins. And I believe that he rose from the dead on the third day. And I declare Jesus Christ the Lord of my heart. And I accept him as the savior of my soul. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen, amen. Can we give Jesus Christ a round of applause? Because I believe somebody has said that prayer, and somebody now is a newborn again Christian, and I welcome you to the body of Christ. How many were blessed today? How many were blessed? Hallelujah. I was blessed, even with all the stuff that went on. I was blessed. Give Jesus a round of applause of, of gratitude, of victory, of thanksgiving. We thank you for your patience. We thank you, if you're still watching at home, for being with us today. We were blessed in spite of all the mess. Ooh, look at that. That rhyme. In spite of the mess, we were blessed. Praise the Lord. Because that's what God does. He blesses us in the midst of our mess. How many say amen? And it's by his grace and his blood. Brother Anthony. Amen? Awesome. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I love that encouragement. Thank you, man. Keep, keep pushing me with those, with those words. I really appreciate that. Guys, how many are ready to go? I'm going to give you your final blessing. Guys, next week, 9 a.m., don't miss it. We will be here as always. Bring somebody, invite somebody. I think we got something special going on. I don't know. There's rumblings. I don't know what's happening, but something's happening. So just come expectantly. Something's going to happen. It'll be a surprise to all of us. But just bring, don't miss it. There you go. If you don't want to miss it, you need to be here. All right. So I will bless you so you can be dismissed. May the Lord, you know, you're going to say this with me because you know it by heart. Let's all say it together. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord have mercy upon you. Oh, see that? Make his face shine upon you and have mercy on you. May the Lord raise his countenance upon you and give you true peace. I now bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the church of Christ says, amen. We love you. We bless you. See you next week, God. Be blessed.